yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fled with the church of Hey guys, sorry for not being in Pittsburgh. As I said, uh, I had to come out here to Seattle. I'm actually in front of the courthouse right now because uh, it's Mushu's boy, Three Fingers, and this guy, Jesus the Goose. They got popped last year for passing bad checks. And so they asked me to come in as a, as a character witness for them. It's, it's not looking good in there for them. Uh, that's their problem, not mine. So I figured, let's come out here and, and do the class lecture. Let's, let's talk about databases. So um, for today's class, we're going to be talking about uh, sort of is a, an overview of what, you know, what these sort of modern query engines or these modern OLAP uh, database systems look like at a high level. And that'll then set us up for how we progress through the various topics throughout the, the rest of the semester. Um, so this is a high level outline of where we're going in this course. And I didn't want to bring this up last, last class because I want to spend time talking about the sort of historical overview of the, the state of the database systems so to understand why we're at the point where we're today and we're focusing on the relational database systems. Um, but this is a high level architecture of, of the roadmap of how to build a modern OLAP uh, database system. So we're going to first talk about, talk about storage, essentially how are we actually going to represent data on disk, compress it, maybe build some indexes that we can use uh, for, for, for accelerating query execution. Um, and then we'll use all that storage uh, ideas about how we want to store the database. We'll then spend most of our time discussing how we actually want to execute queries on this data. So we'll talk about processing models, how to schedule queries, uh, you know, the, the, the tasks within them. We'll spend a lot of time talking about how to do vectorized execution, um, taking advantage of SIMD. Query compilation will be another, uh, another major uh, theme or method we can use to speed things up. We'll spend a lot of time talking about different join algorithms um, and something new that we'll discuss this year that I haven't discussed in previous years is materialized views. And I have to admit, fully admit materialized views is actually something I know the least about in, in database systems. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time on this. And then we'll talk about query optimization. How do you take a query plan, convert it into um, to, to, you know, SQL, SQL query, generate the query plan, how to get, uh, how to design sort of modern network interfaces. And then the rest of the semester after that, we'll be doing a analysis and deep introspection into real systems, like the Snowflake system you guys read in today's paper, but also uh, BigQuery, Spark, um, and a bunch, a bunch of other modern systems. So this, this sort of layer diagram I'm showing here is very similar to what, what we discussed in the intro class, where it's essentially the system for going from the bottom up. You're going to build these different abstraction interfaces, and you know, they'll have, you know, they'll expose an API that we then integrate with in, to the layer above it, and then to the end we end, we end up with the client interface where we expose to the application. So this, uh, going for the next three lectures, four lectures or so, we'll focus on uh, the storage layer, and then that'll then define how we actually want to, uh, ex what API we'll have exposed to us when we want to run queries. Okay. So today's execution, as I said, this is a high-level overview of what, um, of what modern OLAP systems look like. Uh, and so we're not going to go too deep on like what are the algorithms you do for executing queries because that'll also come later. Um, and this class isn't necessarily about distributed databases because I want to spend time discussing, uh, you know, what are the modern techniques of what we do on a single node to process data, and then we'll layer on top of that uh, the, the distri distributed architecture. But it's good to understand a little bit of what 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 these what a distributed system would look like for a modern OLAP system. Uh, so, you know, so understand the big picture where we're going. But it really is, the, as I said before in many other classes, we need to get the single node system to be high performance and super optimized first before we make it distributed. Like, like making a database distributed isn't this magic wand or magic solution that solves all the scalable, scalability problems. Like if you have a crappy single node system, making it distributed just means you have a multi-node crappy system. Uh, so we need to nail that down first. And I'm going to spend a little time talking at the end about this bigger trend about the, the commoditization of the components of, 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 a, of these OLAP systems. So we're most going to be talking about systems like Snowflake and, and Spark, uh, where there are these monolithic systems that are all 
where the, the, the vendor has implemented all the bits, bits and pieces of them. But there is a trend now where people are trying to build uh, sort of standalone pieces of actually the, the layer diagram I showed before. And in theory, one could then tie these, you know, put these things together uh, and later point to a whole new build up system. But we're not entirely there yet, but I'll talk about some early, uh, some early uh, work in, in this space. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so the first thing we understand, what does a distributed query, what does the execution of a distributed query look like in a, uh, what does an OLAP query look like in, in a distributed database system? And I will say at a high level, it's essentially the same as you would have in a single node system. Right? SQL query shows up, the, you, know, you run it through the parser, the, 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 the binder, the optimizer, and so forth, and it'll generate a directed uh, acyclic graph of physical operators, where you have these, these physical operators, like a scan, a, a join implementation, and they're, they're taking some input um, coming from its, its children operators, doing some amount of computation on them, and then passing that along to the uh, to, 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 to its, its, its you know, parent operator, um, and so the the fact that it's this, you know the, these operators may be executed across multiple nodes versus uh, all running on, on the single single box single node at a high level there, there, again there is, really isn't any any difference um, the you know, there's the orchestration of the tasks and so forth, but that's sort of outside the scope of what we're talking about right here today. Like at the end of the day, there's a query plan. We break it up into tasks and we distribute it across nodes. It's no different than taking a query plan, breaking up the tasks and distributing across cores on a, uh, you know, a, a multi-CPU box. So all the operators that we had before when it was a single node system, table scans, joins, and aggregation sorting, all of these exist uh, in, um, in, in a distributed system. So at a high level, it's gonna look like this, right? So say there's gonna be some notion of a worker node and the worker node is gonna have a CPU, it's gonna have local memory, it's gonna have local disk. And, and say if we go from sort of left to right in the diagram here, we're trying to execute a query, the, each of these nodes are gonna be responsible for taking some input in, doing some computation for the operator that, that they've been assigned for a given task and then producing output as, as, as results that then either goes back to the client or goes off to the next, um, to the, the, the next worker nodes. So let's say we start at the very beginning, say this is the bottom of a query plan, uh, and we want to read what we'll call persistent data. So the, the persistent data is going to be the, the underlying tuples of, of the tables that are defined in, in the database. So these are going to be some files that are going to have data that we know how to, uh, to interpret their types uh, based on some scheme information or catalog and we know how to, to access it and scan it and, and do something, right? And so I'm not showing this diagram whether the persistent data is local to uh, the worker node or it's some shared disk architecture or object store, which we'll cover in a second. It, for our purposes here, it doesn't matter. So again, we take in the, the persistent data, we're doing some kind of scan, uh, and we're gonna produce some amount of intermediate data. And then we now need to ship this intermediate data to the sort of the next stage of, of the query plan, which either could be on the same node or on a different node. And so one of the ways we can do this uh, is, in, is through what is called a sort of shuffle, shuffle operation, where the, after we do some, some operator, we would pass along this intermediate data to another set of nodes that are gonna distribute the, the results based on some hash key or some, you know, some, some range partitioning. Um, and then there'll be some other worker nodes that can then pull that data from, from these shuffle nodes. Now, this, I'm putting the shuffle node phase as, as optional here uh, because I don't think Snowflake does this with explicit nodes, but BigQuery and Dremel do this. Um, so the idea is like these in-memory nodes that are, uh, have these, these, these shuffle nodes have a lot of memory, and so they try to keep everything in cache without spilling their disk. And they, it's a way to sort of redistribute things. And I'm also showing here there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between number of shuffle nodes and worker nodes. Doesn't necessarily need to be the case. So you could fan out or, or fan in at this different stage. But again, it's just a way to get the intermediate data from the previous stage to, to the next stage. And if necessary, redistribute it on you know, some new partition key. And then this next worker node does additional computations, right? It has more intermediate data. You say there's a shuffle phase or not, doesn't matter. But let's say now it descends it to this other worker node who then does some file, final aggregation or coalescing of the data to produce the, the result to the application. 
so again, there's nothing really, uh, there's nothing dr you know, drastically, dramatically different than how we'd execute a query on a distributed system versus a single node system. We just may have to do, uh, spend more time doing data movement, which nowadays is actually not as bad as it used to be. It used to be that the, the hierarchy was that the, you know, the, the network, going over the network was always the slowest, then reading from disk was the slowest, and then versus memory. Right? The networks have gotten really fast now. Uh, and especially in the case of BigQuery, they have accelerated, uh, uh, it, they have hardware acceleration for, for these for the shuffle operation. So it's, in some cases, it's actually faster to send things over that network than, than read from disk. So this shuffle phase is not always the, always the big deal. But the main thing I want to sort of expose here is this idea of this notion of, of persistent data and intermediate data, because that's going to depend on, or that what we actually do with these different types of data is going to depend on what the architecture of, of whether it's a shared nothing or shared disk database system. So this taxonomy between uh, persistent data and intermediate data comes from the Snowflake paper that you guys read. Um, and so what they would call persistent data is the, the data that's the, what I call the source of record for the database. So if I insert a tuple uh, as you know, part of the, you know, bulk loading some data or copying or insert operation, the I expect that 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 tuple to reside in the, um, in you know in, in these persistent files in the persistent data. So, in a modern system, we're going to assume that the persistent data, the files of persistent data is is immutable, um, and that's a dramatic change from how people designed or assumed data systems were built from from the years past. Because you assume you're running with a local disk that you can read and write as e as needed, but in a modern cloud setting. Um, where you're running on an object store, or even if you're running on like an early predecessor like HDFS, uh, those file systems were, were some of them were, were append only, but they were, you couldn't do in-place updates. So in the case of a modern lab system, they're gonna assume that these files are immutable, and you, but you still have to support updating them, and you have to maintain some metadata to keep track of how, uh, you know, whether something is, whether a version of a tuple has been, uh, overwritten by a newer version of um, But we'll, we'll come to that, we'll talk about more of that next class. And then the other interesting artifact is gonna be these, uh, what, they, what they call intermediate data. And this is the output of, a, of the operators that we execute in a query plan that we then need to send along to the, the next operator in the query plan. And this actually can be a lot of data. And in the Snowflake paper, they talk about how the amount of intermediate data that a query would generate uh, has no little to no correlation to the amount of data, persistent data they're reading, meaning like the table could be really, really small, but then they still end up producing a lot of intermediate data because of some computation that they're doing. Or it could also be, it's not correlated to the execution time. So if a query takes a long time to run, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to generate a lot of intermediate data. Um, so this intermediate data is, is interesting because it's, 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 it, you need to move it along as fast as possible, but you don't need necessarily need to worry about durability, uh, fault tolerance, uh, and persisting it. Because you know, as soon as you finish the query, you know, the, the next stage going from operator to the next, you immediately throw it away. Right? So the, the paper talks about how uh, the sort of trade-off between deciding when, what to spill into disk, persistent data versus intermediate data. And almost often the case, you want to keep intermediate data in memory as you move it along. So we need to now talk about what the sort of system architecture would look like in a, a modern OLAP system. And there's sort of a couple ways to think about this is, but the end of the day is, is there's the how it's going to move data, uh, or move persistent data to, uh, or to start beginning the execution on the persistent data, like start scanning it. And it'll determine also where, where it's located. Um, and again, in the intro class, we talk about this like sort of like the shared nothing and, and shared disk, or just push the query to the data, pull, pull the data to the query. We talk about these things as being very, uh, these mutually exclusive, but it's actually not the case, especially in a, in a modern, in modern cloud platforms, where you know, systems don't clean divide along these lines. They actually do a little, little bit of everything. Um, and so we can understand sort of the trade offs and the implications of, of these approaches. Um, so the first thing I'm going to say, again, if we want to start, reading persistent data, how should we begin that process? Um, 
And then as we move from one stage to the next, when we execute operators, how do we transfer, or what do we, what do we transfer for, for the intermediate results? So first, just talking about like how do we ex begin the execution of things, or, or, or the, the movement of data. The two choices, again, are pushing the query to the data or pulling the data to the query. Um, and this, again, these ideas aren't new. They go back to a lot of the work that was done in the late 80s, early 90s on some of the first like parallel distributed data system architectures. And the trade-offs of, of how to understand these things, I think have changed in modern times just because of, honestly, the, the, how much hardware has gotten better, especially the, the proliferation of, of cloud services like, like object stores where maybe things in the past, like shared nothing and uh, was, was the dominant uh, architecture that we would, would assume that was the best approach. And it was, it was always logical to, always out, to uh, push the data to the query, to push the computation where the data is located. But now that's not always the case in, in, in the cloud. All right, so the first thing is, again, how we, how we want to initiate the process of, of executing portions of a query on, on, on a database or on data. So the first approach is to pushing the query to the data. And this means that we want to move as much computation as we can to the location of where data is located. And the thought process here is that the, the cost of executing some portion of a query where the data is located was always going to be much cheaper than the cost of transferring the data to, to some other compute node. So again, think about it, I have a disk, on one node, I have a you know, computation on another node. I'd rather send the query to the, the data where the, on the disk that has the disk where it's located, than have to transfer it out because um, the net the net cost is so high. The alternative is to pull the data to the query, and this is where you, uh, the, wherever the query is, you leave it at that computational resource, and then what, and then the data it needs access, or the operator, the, the data that needs operator needs access, you you transfer it over to, to that node. Um, and <clears throat> this can be necessary in a situation where you can't run any queries, you can't do any computation where, where the data is located, right? If I have a, a remote file system where I can't run anything, I, just, I can only do you know, gets and sets and, and deletes, you'd have to do pull data to the query. So as I said, the hardware has gotten uh, much better in recent years where this isn't, uh, this always, isn't always the, the best design choice, um, the pull data to the query, because you know, now again, the network on even cloud systems is, is, is pretty fat. Um, the other interesting thing also too is, as I was saying, these aren't always you know, mutually exclusive anymore because there are some, uh, there are some uh, cloud object stores where you can actually push some computation to, to the data, even though you wouldn't think you, you'd be able to do it. So on S3, they have this uh, select, operator, select uh, operation where you can do something that sort of looks like pseudo SQL uh, a pseudo SQL with a, with a where clause, and you can send that to as an S3 command uh, to do some initial filtering directly in S3, so that you're only now transferring the data that would that would satisfy uh, your where clause. So again, the idea is that I do a select statement. Uh, I can maybe send a portion of the where clause to S3. S3 knows how to uh, natively understand CSV file, JSON, or parquet files. And then do that filtering, and then only send back the results that uh, that that are within the rows that satisfy it. Um, so that's actually pretty powerful now, because like, that's basically pushing the, the data to the query, but not all of the query, but at least enough where you you could do get a big win doing some filtering. Um, Am Am Amazon uh, Azure, or sorry, Microsoft Azure Blob Storage has something pretty similar where you can do. Uh, you can do, do something again that looks like SQL to do some initial filtering. I don't know what file formats they support, but the basic idea is the same thing. So again, just going forward, we're, we're, we're going to be using pull, query to the, pull data to the query for the lower portions of, of the query plan, like the access methods of scanning the tables, uh, but then we're probably going to really push the, uh, but as, and as we go from the intermediate phases, it's also probably going to be pushing data to the query as well. All right, so now we want to talk about like the two high-level approaches for better distributed system. Again, these aren't. Uh, well, th this one is actually pretty. Uh, this is pretty rigid, or this is how this is a clean dichotomy uh, for systems today. But the 
the first type of architecture is the more traditional one people think of distributed database systems is a, a shared nothing system. And this is actually a, a, a phrase or a term coined by Mike Sternbreaker going back to like the 1980s. And again, the idea here was this was presumed to be the better way to build distributed database systems for, for decades, up until you know, maybe, maybe uh, 10 years ago. The idea here is that each is gonna have its own, own CPU, its own memory, its own locally attached disk, right? Think of like NVMe. Um, and the only way that nodes can communicate with each other and see other portions of the database is to send messages over the network, right? So like if, if, if I'm running on one node on, on the left, I need access data on the right, I just can't peek into its, 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 its disk, I gotta go send a message to say, hey, send me that data. And so the, the database is gonna have to be partitioned into disjoint subsets across these nodes, sometimes called shards, um, where each node will have a sort of unique portion of, of the database, of, of, of tables. And ideally, you want to pick a partitioning key that reduces the amount of data transfer you have to do when you do joins. We'll, we'll talk about a little bit this next class, which is it's historically a very hard problem uh, to do. Um, but you know, it, it does make a big difference. The challenge is going to be now that um, since the storage is tied to the compute, I can't easily add either more capacity at the compute side or the storage side without bringing in a whole new node. Now if I bring a whole new node, I gotta do repartitioning to move data around to, to, to balance things out. And so again, we'll, we'll discuss the implications of this. Right, so each, each, of the, sorry, each of these are also gonna call it database. These, this, when I say a node, this, I mean one of these. The other thing too is that because data is considered local, like with a locally attached disk, um, Traditionally, a database system will access the disk using it, like a POSIX API or an NVMe. Like it'll be a uh, you know, syscalls to go read read data directly from disk. Yes, there's the um, you can do kernel bypass, uh, which the the storage data plane kit from Intel. That's a nightmare. We'll talk about that uh, later on. But in general, you're using POSIX to do you know reads and reads and writes to the local disk. And then if I need to send things over the network. Uh, to communicate with another node, you know, make, make the appropriate calls into that as well. The alternative approach for distributed system is called shared disk. And with this one now is <clears throat> we still have on every single database, database system node, they'll have their own CPU, memory, and disk. But that disk on the, each node is going to be essentially just a cache. And that the persistent data or the persistent files of, of the database system is going to be down on this separate storage layer. So at the top here, we'll have the compute layer. This is where we're going to execute queries. Uh, they can communicate with each other over, over network, um, over the network. But th their storage is essentially used for ephemeral data, either as a, as a write-through cache in the case of Snowflake, or a holding area or staging area for intermediate data. But the, the node is essentially stateless, meaning if it crashes, the compute layer, if a node is stateless, meaning it crashes, it does, we don't lose the database because that's all stored down here in the, in the storage layer. And the, the storage layer essentially looks as one giant disk. Uh, it's not entirely true in, in an object store, but because uh, you, you don't access, access it through a POSIX API, you use, a, um, you use like a, a user space API that the, the cloud vendor or the, whatever the, the object store, if you're using, they, they would provide. Um, so, and the reason why this matters instead of using the POSIX API, because if it's a POSIX API, the database system is not aware of, of the, uh, of maybe the the, the the different physical locations of, of of the data. I mean, you would have different file paths and so forth like that. But like, the the database system, it would just see here's some file system I, I, I can read and write to, and maybe not not understand or or could not push down the like the selects and the filtering stuff that we talked about before. If you're using a uh, if you're using POSIX, because there's no, there's no way to do, hey, read this, but also filter some stuff for me down in the storage layer. Just to recap everything, the, the two choices can be shared nothing. Um, and the pros and cons of this that it potentially achieves better performance because uh, the, each database system node, if it's accessing only data that's local to it, um, it'll, be, it'll perform better because it, there's less data movement potentially between between uh, between the nodes, right? <clears throat> and as I said, with modern NVMe drives, you know, with PCIe PCIe 
five or six, the lower the latest one is, those things are pretty fat pipes pretty good, that, that you can get. But yeah, modern, modern networks are pretty good today too. So traditionally it was always gonna be faster to read from local disk than over the network, but it's not always the case these days. Um, but the big challenge is gonna be, is gonna be harder to scale out uh, capacity uh, actually in both directions, up and down. Like I, I can't add new nodes without shuffling data around to, to sort of rebalance things, repartition it. And I can't take nodes away without doing the same thing, like coalescing. Um, now with a shared disk system, in, in, a, modern, in a modern setting in, in, in the cloud, the great big advantage is that we're gonna be able to scale out the compute layer and storage layer independently. Meaning if I find myself being uh, CPU bound on my nodes, then I can add new compute nodes and because they're stateless, I don't have to do, you know, I don't have to move a lot of data around to, uh, to rebalance things. Now again, the Snowflake paper talks about how, how they use consistent hashing to uh, change the assignment of what files are processed from persistent, the persistent, persistent storage layer um, in the, uh, uh, to, to the new nodes. Um, but that's, you know, you're warming it up and, and just telling it, here's, we've got, here's, you know, here, here's, the, here's the data you need to start processing. It's not like you have to always copy things from one node to the other, which other has, you know, if you want to do that safely and not have any false positives, false negatives, requires you to use transactions. It's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so the other nice advantage too, uh, and this matters a lot in, for sort of database systems that want to claim that they're serverless, um, I can shut down the, the compute layer that, that portions that I'm not needing, or the, the nodes that I'm not needing, if I'm not executing any, any queries, and the data doesn't go away. Right, again, in a shared nothing system, because the compute is tied to the storage, if I shut down a compute node, well, that means that that portion of the database that's stored on that node is no longer accessible. Whereas if I shut down compute nodes in a shared disk system, then any other, you know, the other remaining nodes can go get data from the shared disk, no problem. Um, so in a service environment, this, 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 this can make a big, big difference because you can shut down idle things. And then last one is the, the disadvantage we talked about. Like if I have to go retrieve persistent data that isn't cached locally in the compute node, uh, I, have to, you know, I, I have to pull it from, from, the, from the shared disk layer, the storage layer. And maybe I can do some, uh, some early filtering that we talked about from, from Amazon or Azure, um, but you know, that, and that's not always the case because it depends on what, what the, the filter it is actually you want to do. Like you can't do, I don't think you can do complex regex or execute a UDF on, um, on, on S3. Right? They're not going to let you do that. All right, so our focus going forward, the rest of the semester, we're going to focus on shared disk systems. Now, for some of the algorithms that we'll talk about, it doesn't actually matter. Like the, the, the joint algorithms, they don't know, don't care whether it's reading from a shared disk or a share, shared nothing system because at that point of when you're actually computing the join, you've already scanned the table, right, and fed it into a scan operator, so it doesn't matter where it came from. Um, but for the, just in the back of our minds, we're going to be mindful that, okay, we should think about, okay, if I'm scanning this table or scanning data, uh, you know, what does it mean to be coming from, from S3 or, or an object store? So as I, as I said before, traditionally, the, uh, in a shared disk architecture, it was assumed that the storage layer was, was, uh, was, and sh the storage layer would be some dedicated uh, uh, on-prem appliance or, or storage device or NAS uh, that exposed like a POSIX API that you could, you could read and write to. Um, in the more high-end systems like Oral Exadata, they, they do use a storage appliance. Uh, these racks sort of look like this, you have the compute and the storage layer, but the, the, the data system is aware that it's talking to a, a, a you know, special storage, storage appliance and it, it goes over fiber channel and it's not making positive calls to read data, it's, it's actually sending proprietary commands and they actually can do some, some, some predicate push down in these systems. Um, but the systems, the environment we're gonna focus on, as I said, is the object stores, because um, this is how everyone's building these modern OLAP systems to run the cloud. Uh, and the nice advantage is, is that they're, they're infinitely scalable. I put that in quotes, obviously, but like, you know, if, as long as your credit card has, has enough money on it or your, your account has enough money on it, you can keep putting as much data as you want in Amazon S3 and they'll, they'll gladly store it for you with pretty high guarantees and, and durability. Um, and same for Azure and, and GCP's cloud storage. So you no longer have to worry about provisioning uh, 
uh, storage appliance, storage, you know, storage space, like you would have to do in, in, in an on-prem system, you just keep throwing more and more data at the uh, in your storage layer, and uh, you know, and you don't have to scale the uh, you know, scale the compute layer separately either. Um, you just keep putting more data in, and things are great. Okay, so these object stores, wh what do they actually look like? So they're only going to they're going to expose you a pretty simple API. We talked about the Amazon Select, but in general, they're going to have three commands: put, get, and delete. Um, and so what happens is you have these, uh, you know, have your, your data that, that you're ingesting and I'm going to put in your database. You're going to break them up into uh, to, to these large immutable blocks of data, these files, and you're going to do a put and to store it in, in the object store. And then you'll have some catalog that'll keep track of, uh, you know, some file ID is found at this location in, in the object store. So we'll talk more about what these, these, these files look like next class. Um, but in general, they're going to be some binary format for a column store and a columnar format. Uh, and it's going to use a PAX layout where within each block, the, the, the attributes of the table will be broken up in a columnar fashion, but all the attributes for a single uh, logical tuple will be found in that block. And this is different than how like maybe the Vertica would store files, store data, where you would have a separate file for each column in a table. With PACs, you basically have all the data within a single attribute in, in, in the single file. And there'll be a header, sometimes the footer, like in Parquet, will contain metadata about uh, the, the offsets within the file for where columns start, uh, what kind of compression schemes they're using uh, for the different columns, because that, that can change per, um, per file. And sometimes there's pre-computed indexes to do uh, filtering or zone maps. Again, these are things we'll cover uh, later in the semester, but you would store all of that information within the file itself. So now when you want to start accessing this data in the object store, uh, you, you would make a, a request on the object store just to retrieve the header of the, um, the, of, of the file block, and then that'll get all that metadata about where the columns are located and what kind of compression themes are being used. And then you can then do selective uh, gets just to get the byte ranges of the, the data you actually need. So you don't need to bring in the full page uh, or the full block from the, the object store and then parse it. You, do, you can just bring a little bit in, figure out where you need to go to the, get the rest of it, um, and retrieve just the, the minimum amount. Again, that's different than what we talked about doing uh, disk I.O. in the, the intro class, where we'd say, oh, you, you know, eight, every page is eight kilobytes or four kilobytes, and you go fetch the whole thing, even though you, you only need a portion of it. You can be a bit more intelligent here because the blocks are larger and you obviously don't want to retrieve the whole block. Um, I think in Snowflake, the block size is, I think the lowest is like 50 megs and maybe goes up to like 100 megs or something like that. Right, so these aren't small blocks, these are pretty big, so you don't need to fetch the whole thing if you don't need it. So one interesting system I like to bring up is Yellow Brick. Um, so this is actually a slide from a talk they gave with us uh, during the pandemic a few years ago. Um, but it shows just sort of how they're using the object store uh, with S3. Um, so again, this architecture looks a lot like what I've already showed you. You have these worker nodes, um, and they have this locally attached NVM in NVMe SSD. Um, so what's interesting about uh, Yellow Brick is that they talked about how they tried using Amazon's uh, S3 library, like the, the, the access library to communicate with S3, um, and they found it was super slow. So they wrote their own uh, library uh, and they were to get a 3x performance using, you know, just retrieving the same data from S3 using their custom library instead of using Amazon's. So I'm bringing this up just to say that you don't necessarily, you don't have to use whatever the, the cloud vendor provides you for the client side libraries. You can write your own thing and potentially get much better performance. I forget what the secret they used here. They might be doing, um, they might be doing uh, kernel bypass to get through the object store. Again, you can do this on the client side, you can't do it on the server side because Amazon controls the server. Um, but another, I mean, another cool thing they were doing is that they would communicate between uh, the different nodes using UDP with uh, the Intel DPTK, which is uh, the data plane uh, development kit. It's a way to do kernel bypass on talking to the NIC, which is uh, <laughs> not easy to use. We'll talk about this later. All this Intel kernel bypass stuff is like super tricky and, su and super painful. Um, again, we'll cover that throughout the semester. 
All right, there's a bunch of other stuff that we're not gonna talk about today, but we'll, can, we'll start covering these things over the next, uh, throughout the semester. There's different file formats. Again, I've mentioned the packs layout, but we'll talk about different approaches. Uh, and again, all this is gonna be very highly compressed because it's columnar storage. We'll talk about next class of how do you actually decide how to do horizontal partitioning on your tables and split them up uh, you know, based, based on values so you can minimize the data transfer between, between nodes for intimate results. Then there's the whole process of how you want to do ingest new data. Like a big part of databases are obviously you want to put data in it. And so there are, uh, you know, there's fast pass, instead of just running insert statements, there's fast pass to do bulk loading and, and get data into the system as uh, quickly as possible. And obviously you want to be able to update it or attention delete it. How do you handle that, even though the files are immutable? And then we're not going to talk about too much about this, but this will come up when we talk about data lakes, especially with, um, with, uh, Photon and uh, Databricks later on, but the in a, in a modern cloud system, you also want to support the ability for people to have existing files just sitting in S3, uh, like in, in, say in a Parquet format, without having to first bulk load them to your database system. You want to be able to operate directly on the files as they exist. So how do you discover that these files uh, these files exist? Then we'll talk about how to do scheduling, adaptivity. We'll spend a little time talking about. It, it means that. Uh, as the query is running, how do we maybe make changes on the fly to better utilize resources? Maybe we under-provisioned or over-provisioned uh, the tasks or the workers, and we can scale that and make changes as we go along. Again, these, there's a lot of things we're not covering here um, that are important. We'll get to uh, later in the semester. Okay, so I, I talked about this uh, a little bit at the beginning. I want to make an observation here that the, in the Snowflake paper you guys read, even, or even though it's about Snowflake, um, they talk about how Snowflake does certain things, but they make some important observations about, again, what, what a modern OLAP system uh, looks like. That's, that's why I had you guys read it. But the, the thing to point out, uh, is a system like Snowflake, like Dremel, like BigQuery, like Yellowbrick, uh, like, like Databricks, these are monolithic systems, meaning that they're building all the components that, that, that you need for the database system. These are monolithic systems, meaning they're, they're building all the components you need to build a data system entirely in-house with their engineers. And most of the non-academic systems that we'll talk about at the end of the semester are going to have pretty much the same architecture, right? You have a query engine, you'll have some kind of storage layer, you'll have an orchestrator to move data around or execute tasks, scheduler of some sort, right? They're all pretty much implementing the same thing. Um, and that means basically that we have people or they have companies and a lot of money writing the same database system software over and over again, right? They're writing the same thing to do, to do the same thing. Um, and obviously that's a, you know, it's, it's a huge labor effort to do this and it may not be in the best interest for, you know, for, for the database community, broadly speaking, to, to do this, right? If everybody's implementing the same SQL parser, uh, what is that actually, you know, is that moving us forward, right? We, maybe our time would be better spent doing other more innovative things. And so there's this interesting development in the last five years or so where you're starting to see uh, various projects of, of, of from, from in the open source community or organizations to build uh, to break out portions of, of, a, of a modern OLAP system into standalone components that are open source that other people could build on, other people could, could take advantage of, and other people could, to, could, could reuse either for, um, well, for, for, I mean, for their own new OLAP systems, right? Again, the idea here is that everyone, instead of everyone implementing the same thing, this all, you know, redundant parts of the system, let's everyone work together on, uh, you know, one thing, and have that be really, really good, and everyone gets gets to reap the rewards. It's sort of like Linux, right? Linux is, uh, what well, it'd be kind of stupid now or insane outside of, you know, research and academia to try to build a new operating system from scratch and to compete with Linux, uh, where the sort of conventional wisdom or the, the mindset is everyone's focused on, okay, Linux is what we're using, let's make that really, really good. It's not exactly the same because the OS is, is a major, major undertaking where these other parts I'm talking about are much smaller, but the idea is the same thing, right? Instead of having two people build, 
competing parts that do the same thing. Let's let's work together. So you see this in sort of four sort of, sort of, sort of categories, um, and it's you can sort of see how this is tied to the, the different layers I talked about at the beginning, right? So there's people building system catalogs, query optimizers, which is the hardest part of the data system, these file formats, access libraries, and execution engine. So I want to quickly go through these different components and just sort of talk about the, the major efforts, the major major projects, um, and just can be aware of that as we talked about the semester for these, these different engines and different systems. A lot of them aren't going to use these things, but you know, there'll, there'll, be, there'll be potentially open source alternatives for them. And this idea of breaking the system up into reusable components or modular components uh, is not new. And so there's this paper uh, by a famous researcher at MSR, Serge uh, Chaudhry, where he, back in, I think it's, it's like 19, it's two, the year 2000, we talked about what they call risk style database systems. Now this, was, this argument here was built for how to make these different sort of sub-components modular, reusable, and um, uh, to, to make it easier to, to automate the, the tuning of them, all right, make it like a autonomous data system. But the idea of, like, again, breaking the system into these s separate layers that can be implemented through some standard API is, is, is basically the approach that they were talking about in this paper long ago. All right, so the first thing is the system catalogs. And, uh, again, we'll talk about this next class, but system catalog basically is, is the registry where the data, data system keeps track of what the schema looks like, what tables they have, what columns they have, um, and you know, with just persistent files, you know where are they located in the object store on, on disk. And so, the way basic catalog works is that if you're calling, if you're telling the data system to insert the data for you, like an insert query or a copy command, then the data system will maintain its catalogs because it's it's creating the files as it goes along. Um, if there, there's a discovery process, as I said, where there's a bunch of existing SP files, then the catalog needs to have an API or needs a way to be told, hey, there's these files and you be aware of them. So there's now several projects where people build. Uh, these these sort of cloud catalogs that essentially again just keep track of what data exists, uh, what tables and columns are in these these files. Sometimes there's some basic statistics about what's in what's in them, but as I said before, oftentimes those statistics are stored in the file themselves. Um, so probably the most famous one or widely used one is the H catalog. And this came out of the Hive project. Um, it's a wrapper of the Hive Metastore. Um, I know you can use this for Spark. I think there's some other systems that take advantage of it. And again, think of it just like, it's like a key value store that keeps track of, of again, the database schema. Google has this data catalog. Amazon got its Google catalog, data catalog. It's, they're all doing basically the same thing. But H catalog is actually the only open source one. The next is the query optimizers. Uh, so we'll spend a, several classes talking about query optimization. But think of these are just generic frameworks where you can define the heuristics or the cost-based search rules to do query optimization. Like how to take a, I mean, some of them actually they'll parse the SQL query for you, but then convert it into a, a logical plan through transformation rules and then run a cost-based search to generate a physical plan. Um, and so the, this is the hardest part of building a database system because there's all these corner cases in SQL, there's all these optimization rules that you can apply to, 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 to deal with correlated subqueries. Like it gets very messy very quick. Um, and the idea is that rather than everybody building their own first crappy heuristic optimizer, which everyone does, you know, in theory you could have a cost-based search that was pretty powerful um, out of the box. So the, the two notable open source implementations are Apache Calcite and Greenblum Orca. Calcite is, came out of LucidDB. LucidDB was a, was a, I think, commercial system late 2000s uh, that failed, but for whatever reason, uh, Calcite was pulled out and was reused uh, again, as a standalone query optimizer, which is pretty cool. And then the Greenplum guys built this thing called Orca. It was designed to be the query optimizer for both uh, Greenplum, which is an OLAP system, as we talked about last class, uh, that VMware now, or sorry, yeah, that VMware owns. Um, and, but they also built it for this other thing called Hawk, which is like their version of SQL on top of Hadoop. And so they tried to build a single optimizer framework that could be used in both systems. Hawk is still around. It's not that I don't think people actually use it, but Greenplum uses it as well. Um, so the main thing is to think about is Greenplum is less known than Calcite. It's written in C++. Uh, Calcite is written in uh, Java, and that's more used. That, there's more systems using Calcite. Um, I don't know wh whether which one's more powerful or not. Like uh, they're, you know, they, they both look roughly equivalent. 
All right, then there's also these open source file formats. And actually, this is a pretty, uh, this is a pretty novel idea that is definitely uh, possible, made possible by sort of a, a modern cloud systems. Um, so historically, database systems always use their own proprietary data format, right? SQLite, Postgres, MySQL, whatever, you name it. Then when they write files to disk, it's in their proprietary binary format. Like, so you can't take up, you know, Postgres data files and read them in, in, in MySQL Oracle. Um, DuckDB can read SQLite files, but it's designed to do that, but you get my point. And so the only way to really transfer data or be able to take data from one data system and reuse it or do computations on it in another data system is if you dump it out as, as a CSV or JSON file, right? So uh, starting in the last decade, there was this movement to say, okay, well, let's actually build these binary file formats so we don't have to dump it as, as like text-based formats like JSON. And then we can build libraries for these different database systems that can access this stuff very efficiently. Right? So these libraries essentially expose you an inter iterator to retrieve batches of columns from these files. You can do some uh, you know, selective scans for like pick which columns you actually want. Um, and some of them will do, they do all the decompression stuff for you. But again, they're, they're just like this, the lowest level of the query plan is the access methods. So this is just, these, these are the, this is probably the six most uh, widely used or famous ones. Um, in 2013, there was Parquet and Orc and Carbon Data came out. Parquet is probably the most, the most widely used one. This is a compressed columnar format from uh, Cloudera and Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, it has more aggressive the compression than Orc. Um, whether or not it's fast or not depends on, depends on what the data looks like, depends on what, what, how you're actually accessing it. So I can't say one's better than another. It depends on a lot of things. But the, at a high level, they're, they're, they're pretty, they're basically equivalent. Or it came out of uh, Facebook's Hive project. Carbon data came out of Huawei. And as I said, I think in the, in the intro class, uh, I'm working with a former student of mine, uh, and he actually tried using carbon data, and all the open source libraries don't compile, don't work. So I don't know of anybody outside of Huawei that uses the carbon data. Um, Iceberg is a newer one at a Netflix, and uh, we'll see a little bit of this next class, where it's a way to do uh, support updates and schema evolutions over Parquet files. So like you can do, they have like a Delta store, you can do updates and then apply them you know, to do the Parquet files plus you know, read the historical data. HD5 is a much older uh, data format from the scientific community, um, it's from the late 90s. This is for multi-dimensional data. Uh, Again, I don't know of any sort of commercial database system that, that uses HD5, HDF5. It's primarily used for, as I said, for uh, scientific calculations, scientific instruments. And then Apache Arrow is, a, um, is an in-memory columnar format that's designed to be the exchange format for sort of sharing data between processes and over the network very efficiently. Um, again, Think of it like it looks something like Parquet, but it's it's for in memory data. So for our class, this class, we're mostly going to be focusing on, on things that look like Parquet and Orc and Arrow. Um, and then for project uh, project one, which I'll we'll discuss next class, will be you know building a foreign data wrapper to parse something that looks like a Parquet file without exactly being Parquet. All right, the last one that's super interesting is the standalone library to query execution. And this is kind of what the whole point of this class is. As I showed in the very beginning, we're going to spend a lot of time talking how to build the execution engine, how to do vectorized execution, how to do uh, query compilation, how to do joins. Right? That's the, it's not the hardest part of the data system. That's always the query optimizer, but this is certainly the part that like, uh, can have you know, a huge, huge impact on performance. Obviously, if you generate a crappy query plan, you're screwed anyway. But like, the, the, you know, having this, doing this right can, can make a big difference. So there's now work being done to build standalone query engines that are vectorized. They use all the modern techniques that we were talking about before. Um, again, the input's just a DAG of physical operators. They've required something else to do the scheduling and, and do access to or just get the data, do orchestration, move data around. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, the, it's like the kernels are essentially the query operators. So the most famous one of this is going to be uh, Velox, um, which we'll spend time talking about um, at the end of the semester. But this is actually really fascinating now because, you know, vectorized query execution is, is sort of uh, what made Snowflake so good and so u unique, or at least it was the starting point of making it so unique 10 years ago, right? That they were building one of the first vectorized database engines. Um, 
now it's so commonplace, everybody, everybody has vectorized execution for the most part. But you know, 10 years ago, this was a big deal. But now uh, Facebook is building Velox. There's data fusion from the Arrow and InfluxDB guys. Intel has his, uh, his OAP thing. Um, yeah, so now this is super interesting because you know, Facebook is going to spend a lot of time building up this, this, this execution engine that anybody could come along and build a wrap around and make the next Snowflake and not have to worry about writing the execution engine. Uh, and essentially this becomes a commodity, like a vectorized execution engine using the modern techniques we're talking about today. It does not make, does not differentiate one system from the next. It's going to now going to be the, the communication between the different nodes, sort of like the yellow bricks that we talked about before, and then all the query optimizers. Everything all right? Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Just making sure you're okay. My boys in there. I got, I got teaching class. Your boys in here? Yeah, I'm, te I'm teaching class now. Like, okay. Yeah. Who's in here? I, my, this other guy. He's almost. He's almost done. Oh, he's coming down. Yeah, he's coming down. Yeah, I, the, FBI? we're good. Huh? From the FBI? No, no, no. It's just. It's like my. Oh, okay. All like. Right. Yeah. yeah. Have a good uh, thanks. Okay. Um, anyway, so this is super super fascinating, and we'll spend a lot of time with this. All right. So for. Um, uh, right. So the this was just supposed to be a high level approach, a high level overview of what the query optimizers look like. Um, again, as I said, the the way you on, on the single node itself. You would build these systems is not, or each worker node is not different than how you build a single node data system. It's going to be that data movement stuff that we talked about before, and also again assuming that we're coming from retrieving data from a cloud-based object store, shared disk. So the rest of the semester we focus on how to build the these different components that we talked about, and, and make them you know using the modern techniques, right? All right. So next class we're going to talk about storage models. We're going to talk about how to represent data within the actual the columns themselves, the bytes do table partitioning and then in system catalogs as well. So hopefully again I gotta deal with these guys, figure out what, what's going on with them. Uh, hopefully they'll be done soon. Uh, and then um, and then I'll I'll film the class uh, the next class and post that on YouTube as well later on. Okay? And then next class we'll again we'll talk about project one. Alright guys, have a good night. See ya. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. <laughs> <laughs> no. What is it? Yes! It's the S T Cricket I D E S. I make a mess unless I can do it like a Geo. Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dude. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup say I'm a fool cause I drink fruit. Put the bus a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Show. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 bounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Isaac's straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>